let me give you just a little background because we got a lot of ground to cover and we got a very short period of time. Um, I came into recovery myself in 1971. I'm a Vietnam vet. I went in the Marine Corps at 17 with an alcohol problem. I came back from Vietnam in 1971 with an alcohol and problem with drugs other than alcohol. And so my recovery started in a program that the Marine Corps developed to try to help Vietnam vets instead of just throw them back into the communities, right? So they had what was called the drug exemption program instead of uh, they exempted us from prosecution under the Code of Military Justice and they put us in treatment. So they gave us an option to try to find and to address our problems and to deal with us and then return to service in the Marine Corps. And I was the third Marine admitted into the program on the third day of the program. So I was very, very fortunate as I look back. And at that point in time, you know, I was, I turned myself in for help really to get out of trouble because I got busted going from LAX to Hawaii with some drugs in my pocket. And the LAPD uh, police officers, they decided not to arrest me because one of them was a Vietnam vet. And he said, I'm going to report you to commanding officer. Well, that meant the break. <laughs> I didn't want to go in the break. Throw me in jail. Please, don't put me in the break. You know, <laughs> I don't want to go to the break. So when I got to Hawaii, and like I always did, whenever I got in trouble, I started to scheme how I could get out of that trouble. See, I believe that every addict is great at harm reduction. We know what to do <laughs> to minimize the consequences of our behavior. And we're always figuring out ways. How can I reduce this harm? And that's what I was doing. I was say, if I turn myself in, maybe they'll just discharge me. I'll get out of the core, head back to Chicago, get Hendrix back on, and uh, start the party again. Well, that's not what happened. When I turned myself into the first sergeant, said I need help, which was all a scam, he looked at me and said, Berger, you are one lucky Marine. <laughs> no. well, how's that, Tom? He goes, because we just started this program. And then he told me about the program, and then I was put in that program. And then a light bulb went on for me, right? They brought in this man who was in recovery himself. His name was Tom McCall. <clears throat> they had no idea what they were doing. They put a captain in charge of the program because he had a bachelor's degree in psychology. Well, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology. He didn't know what he was doing. I wouldn't have known what I was doing. But they knew they didn't know, so they turned to the 12-step community, and there was a very strong 12-step community in Hawaii. A lot of young people were getting well and finding a new way of life. And one of those young people came to talk to us and share his story on a Tuesday night. They called it the drug rap session. And that night changed my life, blew me away. This gentleman got up and talked about himself in a way I wouldn't have dared. I would not let anybody see what he was sharing. He was so vulnerable, he was so authentic, he was so real, and he was so free from himself. That's what I wanted every time I got high. Every time I drank, I wanted that freedom from myself. That's why I was drinking and using, because that was the only way I knew how to achieve that. But here was someone who was found a way to live his life and to experience that freedom from what he was doing, not from a drug he was taking. I like that. Something about that spoke to something very deep inside of me. And I went up to him afterwards, I said, how did that happen to you? And he says, stick close, I'll show you how. And I did. <laughs> just like Chris has with me. And, uh, it's, you know, Tom just started to lead me in my early recovery. After I was sober about 60 days, they didn't have any counselors. They said, hey, would you like to come on board? So with 60 days clean, I became a counselor. <laughs> the blind leading the blind. Sometimes I was a step ahead of the guy. Sometimes they were a step behind. But what I discovered is that People were getting well because we had one thing, even though we didn't have any of the technology, right? We had no idea about psychotherapy theories and all, but it was one addict talking to another addict and an addict who cared for that person and had faith in them that they could find a new way of life. That ingredient is a powerful curative factor. And I don't ever want to lose sight of that. It's when somebody feels like you really care that things can happen very different in a person's life. 
And that's what was happening in that program. We didn't know what we were doing, but man, if I sat down with you, I was interested in helping you try to figure out whatever you need to figure out to find a new way of life. So today, that's how I describe recovery. I think recovery is about the discovery of new possibilities. And one of the things I got exposed to back in 1971, so this past summer, I celebrated 46 years clean and sober. So it's a long time that I've been around. Thank you. Um, but one of the things I've discovered, early on I was introduced to Bill Wilson's letter. He wrote a letter in 1956 to a fellow out in California who was struggling with depression. This letter became published in 1958 in the AA Grapevine underneath the title, The Next Fr Emotional Sobriety, The Next Frontier. In that letter, Bill kind of put together, <clears throat> synthesized, and shared all of his ideas that he had about emotional sobriety. Now, I thought that was the first place that emotional sobriety was talked about, right? Because it was back early 56. But then I went and I reread the 12 and 12 recently. Herb and I do a bunch of workshops. We've got a, a whole series. We've got an introduction, a whole day introduction for people in recovery about emotional sobriety. We follow it up and we're going to be doing one of these here in in the coming months called uh, Fostering Emotional Sobriety Through the Steps. And then we do a whole day of helping people learn how to unpack when they're upset and disturbed and how to self-regulate better. And uh, we take those things and we have the dog and pony show and we take it up to San, you know, uh, where we were at. What was our last one in uh, San Diego? Uh, no, it was uh, Costa, Mesa, Costa Mesa. North Island. That's and right, North Santa Island. Barbara. And we did it in Santa Barbara and stuff. And so people in recovery are loving this stuff. They're saying, God, you helped me find the Bill Wilson I've been looking for. And we're glad to be able to do that. And so I put together a new talk called the 12 Core Concepts. So without any further ado, let me jump into this, but let me finish that thought. So I reread the 12 and 12. And when Bill is talking about step 12, the last paragraph, the last sentence of that first paragraph, he says that if we practice these steps, that we and those about us start to experience emotional sobriety. So actually, when he wrote the 12 and 12, which was 15 years after writing the big book, he realized that the whole process was about helping people establish emotional sobriety. Well, not many of us think that way, but we're starting to think that way more and more. So what we're gonna do is define emotional sobriety, explore the 12 core concepts of emotional sobriety, I'm going to talk about some clinical interventions you can do to promote it and discover, hopefully, some new possibilities in your practice. So let's look at emotional sobriety and define that. So this is what Bill said. He said, here we begin to practice all 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. That's the first place emotional sobriety was written about. I think many old students will put our woes cures to severe emotional stress. Turn that up, that's why we're going to connect right into the same thing. They often lack emotional sobriety. Perhaps that will be the spearhead for the next major development in AA, the development of much more real maturity and balance, which is to say, humility in our relations with ourselves, with our fellows, and with God. So this was his first definition that I could find of what emotional sobriety was. He talks about real maturity and balance, right? The development of more real maturity and balance. Then he talks about humility in terms of relationship with ourselves, with others, and with our God, as we understand him. Now, it's weird, but most of the time, unless you're trained as like a gestalt therapist or somebody else that does what we call parts therapy, we don't think of being in relationship to ourselves, but we all are, right? You talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody else. And we don't pay attention to that oftentimes in terms of what is the quality of that conversation. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy has really brought that to the foreground, right? And again, it's focused on what kind of thoughts are we having, you know, automatic negative thinking and challenging that and all that other stuff. But in gestalt therapy, we define mental health as a coordination of all that you are. So if you're going to be able to function in a healthy way, then you need to take all the different parts of you 
and bring them into harmony so that they become joint contributors to your wholeness. See, that's the way we think about it in terms of Gestalt therapy, is that you need to be able to coordinate all that you are. Now, we see addiction as an example of when one part of a person, we'll call it the addict self, takes over and runs the rest of them. Well, obviously, that's not the best in them running the rest of them, right? It's the worst in them running it. But that's how we think about this. So when we talk about being in relationship with ourselves, we're thinking about how to be coordinated with all these different parts. In the rooms, you'll hear people talk about the committee that goes on in a person's head. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're talking about. How to deal with that committee in a way that's going to contribute to that person's well-being and, um, rather than sabotage it or undermine it. So this is the definition I came up with. I think that this is a good working definition for now. I say emotional sobriety is when the best in you does the thinking and talking for all of you. This state of mind is achieved when what you do becomes a determining force in your emotional well-being, rather than allowing your emotional well-being to be overly influenced by external events or by what others are or are not doing. <clears throat> When the best in you does the thinking for all and act speaking for all of you, right? And when you become the determining force in your lives. Now, you're going to see that what undermines emotional sobriety is emotional dependency. Because when I'm emotionally dependent on you, then I'm no longer the determining force in my life. You are. It's what you do determines how I'm going to feel. Right? If you validate me, then I'm okay. If you agree with me, then I'm okay. If you think the way that I think, then I'm okay. But if you don't, then what happens? Well, I got one of three options. I try to convince you that my way is much better than your way of thinking. Right? I control you or try to dominate you and try to manipulate you into doing it my way. Or we become a people pleaser and we go along with other people so that they love us and care about us. Right? Or we cut the relationship off. We have an emotional cutoff. All three of those things are a part of the emotional dependency, are, are, are never solutions to it. The solution to it is staying connected in a relationship that you're experiencing tension in and adding more of yourself. Staying connected and adding more self. That's the heart of emotional sobriety is to learn how to stay connected and add more self. That'll become more obvious as we kind of plow through this stuff. Well, Dr. Brandon, this is Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. He was a psychologist that um, had an affair with Ayn Rand. That was one of the things that he was very infamous for. Uh, but he was a brilliant, brilliant therapist at an office in Beverly Hills as well. He says that self-responsibility begins with the recognition that I am ultimately responsible for my own existence. That no one else is here on earth to serve me, to take care of me, or to fill my needs. So that's what we're promoting with emotional sobriety. That it's what you do determines your well-being. And to do that, you need to take responsibility for yourself. Which also includes taking responsibility for the level of awareness that you bring to your life at any given moment of your life. And we don't often think that I am responsible for my level of awareness or my level of consciousness. We just kind of take that for granted. But it's not something to be taken for granted. Because if somebody's going to establish emotional sobriety, they're going to have to increase their level of awareness about how they're functioning and what they're doing and how they're reacting. So we create emotional sobriety when we live optimally by taking full responsibility for our own emotional well-being. Well, let's look at the 12 core concepts that we need to, I think, integrate if we're going to end us there. So the first one is to develop an awareness of the gravitational pull of emotional dependency. Emotional dependency has a gravitational pull. It's going to always pull you down to your lower self, to the worst in you. It's not going to help you rise to the best of you. And in a relationship, when two people are emotionally dependent, then they're going to bring each other down to the lowest common, lowest common denominator in terms of their functioning. 
that's why we talk about like an emotionally focused therapy about you know busting up those those negative escalation cycles right those kinds of things that are happening because that's what happens when we're emotionally dependent on somebody else now I think Brandon was right on when he said this in a sense we create ourselves through what we're willing to take responsibility for you see if, if I'm able to take responsibility for my level of consciousness and for my own emotional well-being that I'm now creating a whole different experience in my life. When I don't and I make you responsible, then I become emotionally dependent. Now, is there, who has brought the audiovisual person in? I wonder, could you ask him, because the audio is not connected up to the thing, and because there's a slide later on I want the audio to be on. Would you grab him again? That would be helpful. Hey, Dr. Berger. Speaking of audiovisual, Dr. Berger. What's that? I don't know if you know we're recording yet, so no, have I don't. There, if you wanna. Okay, you want me to stay more over here? Don't see what you know. All right. So this is one of the quotes from that letter. We don't have the audio well. It hardly hears. Failing to get these things according to my professional training. His name is. I can't see it in black. I had fun. The black just says emotional sobriety. No, the name of the Oh, Bill Wilson. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Bill said this, is what he realized when he was sharing his observations with other people, is that his basic flaw had been dependence. He called it almost absolute dependence. I call it emotional dependence. And he said on people or circumstances to supply him with prestige, security, and the like. So how he felt was dependent on how other people were dealing with him. He couldn't keep his own center of gravity, right? His center of gravity was placed outside of himself. When he didn't get these things according to his perfectionist dreams and specifications, he fought for them. And when defeat came, so did his depression. Now, you know what you could do, Marley? You could sit behind there and try to find it. <laughs> and then you become yeah. the determining force in that video. <laughs> I need to have a rail. Yeah, because I'm not going to hold still. I'll, you know, I'll tell you that right now. I just wanted to remind you just in case. I know. Here. But you can do that. Seriously, you can stand up there and have fun following me around. It sounds like fun. <laughs> so, this goes back to what I said before. Remember there's the three different reactions we have when we're emotionally independent. Bill's response was to try to control other people. That's his fighting for them. And then when they, people didn't go along with his nonsense, all he could do would feel deflated and defeated. And then he got depressed because he didn't know how to hold on to himself, how to soothe himself how to regulate himself. That's what we hear now. There's a lot of talk about self-regulation. But that's what he realized. Now remember, this is back in 1956 before anybody's talking about this stuff, but what you're going to find out is that every master therapist back then was talking about this stuff. Because this is a problem with the human condition. We all have a tendency to externalize our responsibility for our emotional well-being. Which just means that we don't, we haven't matured, we haven't grown up in many ways. So we get stuck. The king baby kind of stuff, right? Or queen baby, there's also a new pamphlet in case that they call that. This is the way Fritz Perls said it. This is the founder of Gestalt Therapy. He goes, Our dependency <clears throat> makes slaves out of us, especially if this dependency is the dependency of our self esteem. So if you need encouragement, praise, pats on the back from everybody, then you turn everybody into your judge. Everybody becomes your parent, a critical parent, and now you're stuck in that kind of a relationship. But there's no freedom there, right? Because you're so connected to what the other person's doing. Virginia Satir said it in a very, talked about the same thing, but just from a different perspective. She goes, we're always trying to get out of our emotional jail. Mostly we try by begging, threatening, or pleasing other people, trying to get them to do it for us. Our jail being the emotional dependency, our jail being our dependency on somebody else for us to be okay. Now you can see already these are three very different therapists talking about something very similar, aren't they? Same kind of ideas that they have. Brandon says it this way, low self-esteem causes an excessive preoccupation 
was gaining the approval and, dis and avoiding the disapproval of others, hungering for validation and support at every turn of our existence. So you see the gravitational pull of this emotional dependency, right? It really gets us to be hyper-focused on what the other person is doing. <clears throat> they got popularized with what term? Codependency. But people were talking about codependency way back before there was any label of codependency. We knew this was a problem. That's not news in any way. Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. Now we got My it. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. So, back just to review, but now we see how audience work. Good. Very good. All right, let me run that. So we did this. Let's go. Uh, Virginia. And by the way, these handouts are available by sending me an uh, email, and I'll shoot you guys all the slides. Oh, cool. Thank so you yeah. don't have to do copious yeah. notes. Uh, <laughs> I open resources. In fact, if you go to my website under here, yeah, your hand's dying already. If you go to my website, I now have uh, a page of handouts that you can download a lot of stuff off of my website. I open source this stuff because I think it's important for us to just share this Absolutely. stuff, right? And not hold, you know, trademark it or copyright it or yeah. whatever, you take it and share it. I'll ask you if you share, share something that I helped you realize, share that I helped you learn that, right? That's all. And awesome. when they're small like this, you can yeah. take the, yeah. the idea of the Yeah, great. So this is Dr. Polster, Marion and Irving Polster. Um, Marion passed away a number of years ago. Um, Irv is now retired, but he'll be at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference coming up in Anaheim in December. But this is what they said. If our freedom depends exclusively on another person allowing it, we lose our own sense of the part we must exercise in protecting and defining our own psychological space. You see that? If I'm dependent on you, then I'm asking you to make me feel safe. But if I take responsibility, then I need to figure out how to take care of myself regardless of what's going on in any situation. This is a very different approach than the attachment approach, right? <clears throat> and you guys will see that this is an approach that we talk more about being on the differentiation side of the equation, right? Not on the attachment side, although the attachment stuff, there's, we're not polarized with that, we're just saying that we want to help people stay grounded in this perspective. So for the most part, our emotional dependency is unconscious. We don't even realize how dependent on other people we are until we're upset. When you get upset, when something happens in your life that bothers you, what you have an opportunity <coughs> to do is discover one of your unenforceable rules. And we're going to talk more about that. But what Bill said in step 10 is that it's a spiritual axiom that every time I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. So it's not that you're a knucklehead. There's something going on with you. You may be a knucklehead, but my getting upset with you is my issue. You follow me? And if I dig into that, as you're going to see if we get that far, um, is that my being upset has to do with an expectation I have about how you're supposed to behave for me to be okay. That I am coming up with an idea that life has to conform <coughs> to my expectations for me to be all right. So you see, now I'm dependent on things going a certain way for me to be okay. Not just people, but events now have to unfold in my life a certain way for me to be okay. So the dependency extends way beyond just interpersonal. It ex what we call it's externalized to everything in a person's life. That makes sense. You guys see how that works. So core concept number two is that we need to surrender our special status, which tells us that we can impose our expectations on others and on life itself. So a lot of people don't even realize that we're claiming a special status the minute I say, you should do what I think you should do. What gives me a right to tell you that? 
Well, my emotional dependency is what gives me that right because I'm so dependent on what you do, I'm going to try to control you so I can feel good all the time. Mm. That's where we get to see it. The Gestalt therapy prayer says, I am I and you are you. I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations and you're not in this world to live up to mine. But if by chance we meet, fine, let's enjoy it. If not, it can't be helped. But that's the idea that we're basing this on, right? That I don't have any right dumping my stuff on you. Now, I can have whatever rules I want for myself. I can hold myself to any standard I want. But to impose them on you, I'm crossing the line at that particular point. Uh, <clears throat> Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence almost absolute <coughs> dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. So you see how clear it was for Bill? He really gained a lot of insight from the work he did on this whole issue. So he knew he had to surrender those things. This is Dr. Jerry Greenwald. He was also uh, a Gestalt psychologist. He was at UCLA, trained with Fritz and Jim Simkin and all those other folks when Fritz was out here. He said expectations lead to the erosion of any relationship. The myth that the resolution of loneliness will result because we have found an intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship is a cop-out. It begins a toxic process that which dissipates the mutual nourishment that occurs when both people are committed to sustaining, nourishing interaction and growth of their separate selves. You see, that's what he started to identify, right? It's that pernicious, this whole thing. It's that toxic to ourselves and to our relationships. So the next core concept is we need to be aware of our and surrender our unenforceable rules. So I surrender my special status and now if I continue down that line, I have to be able to identify my unenforceable rules and now surrender those. This is what Fritz said. As long as you fight a symptom, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Anybody that tries to control their drinking as an alcoholic understands that completely, right? It gets worse. If you take responsibility for what you're doing to yourself, how you produce your symptoms, how you produce your illness, how you produce your existence, you get in touch with yourself and growth begins, integration begins. That's the bottom line, is that's the work in emotional sobriety and we're gonna be starting a certification program that helps therapists help people get in touch with how they produce their symptoms and how to take responsibility for themselves and grow themselves along these lines. But we have to be able to see what we're doing, right, and how we're creating our existence by our emotional dependency and how that doesn't leave many other possibilities. So this is the rule book, right? The emotional dependency generates all these unenforceable rules. These rules are about how life is supposed to be, how life should be for me to be okay. And then we go about it and imposing those demands on life. And then when life doesn't live up to our expectations, what do we do? One of those three things I talked about, we check out, we become people pleasers or we try to control somebody else. If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependence and its consequent demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender to hobbling demands. Then we can be set free to live and love. We may then be able to gain emotional Surprising. See, if I don't have a demand on how you're supposed to be, I can get busy focusing on what I need to do to take care of myself, right? What I need to do to be able to soothe myself, to regulate myself, to modulate my reaction, to take care of myself then. But if I'm so dependent on you, then where's all my energy going to be focused on? What are you doing? How are you behaving? How are you feeling? I'm going to be hypervigilant to that other person. I love this quote from Virginia Satir, the people makes. He goes, one of truly basic problems is that our society bases 
the marital relationship almost completely on love and then imposes demands on it that love can never solely fulfill. If you love me, you won't do anything without me. I felt that way in my relationships. If you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll give me what I want. I love this last one. If you love me, you'll know what I want even before I ask you. I've said that to people. That's how crazy I am. I've said that. My God, if you really were interested in me, you'd know that. I wouldn't have to say it. Now, why am I doing that? Because I'm not taking any responsibility because I don't have my own voice. You see, if I don't know how to speak up and ask for what I want, then I'm dependent on you figuring out what I want. Dr. Kempel, my mentor, said a really interesting thing. He says, when you're an adult, there's only two reasons to do something. Because you want to or you don't. Really? I never heard that before in my life. I made it so much more difficult. Right? Because I didn't value myself. I didn't think I had to write. And I was worthwhile to be able to take a stand for it and keep it that clean. She goes, when we do this, she goes, these practices soon turn love into a kind of a blackmail. She calls it the clutch. In the program, people refer to it as taking hostages. Right? That's what a relationship turns out to be. We save our worst behavior for those people we care about. But isn't true love, you make me complete? No. True love is, um, well, how I would say it, is that true love is about enjoying each other and encouraging the other person to find a way to make themselves complete. See, it's not about me needing you to make me complete. It's about if we have what I would call mature love, then we're inspiring each other to become whole and not be in enabling each other, right? Immature love, as Eric Fromm called it, is based on dependency. Mature love is union with the preservation of integrity. So when I cooperate with you, I'm cooperating with you because I want to. Not because I'm afraid you're not going to love me if I don't. You follow me? It's a very different dynamic in terms of what that looks like. Pressure. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, as a parent, because I just keep thinking I'm an 11 year old and this is our relationship. You know, like, how, how, um, I mean, obviously he's young and he doesn't understand mature, you know, mature love. But as a parent, I mean, much of what his, what he does, I'm sure, you know, he's doing it because he wants to please. He wants to cooperate with you, please, please, right and, up. You know, feel, feel and, like he's loved. And your job as a parent is yeah. to try to discourage that if he's doing it and losing his integrity. See, one of the things that we're talking about... When I about, think of integrity, I think of your work. <clears throat> How are you... I think of individuality, then. Okay. If a kid is cooperating and loses their individuality, that kid's going to end up in a lot of trouble. And see, unfortunately, what we see in our society, in our culture, and in all these parenting things is we encourage cooperation at the expense of individuality. Doesn't matter what you feel, I want you to do what I want you to do. You know, I could give you so many examples. Well, when that happens, you're going to get a kid that's so lopsided in their development. They're going to know how to cooperate, but they're not going to know how to honor their individuality. And so what's going to happen? Individuality is going to go away. It's got to show up some way. They're going to get rebellious. Or they're going to be a people pleaser. They're going to be what everybody else wants them to be. But they're going to show signs because those signs, if the kid's just one way all the time, it's not a good thing. You know, we want that kid to have a full range of behavior available for them so they have that full range of behavior when they grow up and they're in a relationship. And if I need to, to be firm and take care of myself, I can be firm. If I need to be soft, I have the capability of being soft. But I want to be able to be a man of all seasons or a woman of all seasons in order to best take care of myself. But we're not going to do that if we encourage the, the cooperation. And so what I say, in our society, the cooperation becomes so emphasized. And that's, to me, why we're seeing all these signs of people saying, I want to be an individual. Tattoos are a big part of that right now. It's an expression of saying, I'm going to be myself, right? You know, you're not going to define me. I'm going to define myself, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a, right, I'm going to use my body as, as, as that billboard that says, this is me. Well, great. If you can do it that way, I'd like you to be able to use your words to do that at some point. I'd like you to be able to say that in relationship to somebody, talk about it that way. 
Because when we don't, then we go to these other ways, right? You follow me? Yeah. And doesn't this begin at birth? What's I mean, the rhythms that people start in their family. When I work with these newborn it's and these exactly. families, it's either they're all into this attachment therapy, and pick it up every time. Sit, yes, oh, um, which is too I, much. And I try to understand if you don't let it have some individuation. And frustration gets the individuation. Frustration is a valuable thing, but we're so phobic of that in our society is we don't want anybody to be upset. <laughs> Please don't be upset. And so we try to make everything perfect. And what are we doing? We're setting up. We got a, you know, we're setting up a society where we're just continuing to perpetuate a lot of these issues. And the crying is the voice. And they want to nip it. It's, oh, oh, I know. Oh, instead, of, instead of just being able to listen to the child <clears throat> and, and what the child is saying. codependence, yeah, too. That that's like, all the time. I got, I I got a parent right now. Me, right? They were sitting in there the other day, <laughs> and they're, they're, um, the young man um, was brought in with his parents. And he's a very bright young man. He's like seven or eight years old at this point in time. And his mom is pushing that he doesn't cooperate and boy she misses the mark this kid is so cooperative even to the point and this is what happens and i know this is a fear and it's going to take us off of getting this thing done but it might be worthwhile see what we know is that a kid's going to always cooperate with what the parents are doing so a kid's going to learn all the rotten behavior there's no question about it right and this kid's learned his parents rotten behavior he tries to control them to get them to do what he wants because guess what they do they try to control him to get what they want from him. And there's no respect for the other person in it. But when he does it, it's a problem. So now they come down on him and criticize him for what they've taught him. And that's when kids get really messed up, is when they start getting faulted for what the parents are teaching them and told that's wrong and you should be ashamed of yourself. Because what are they doing? They're honoring their folks. They're being exactly what their folks have taught them to be. <laughs> and now they're told that's, that they're wrong because of it, but it's okay for the parents. That's, you want to you develop a drug addict? You know, put them in a situation and give them lots of that kind of treatment. You know, that's the kind of stuff that grows us in those other directions. It's, and it's terrible. We could just go spend the rest of the afternoon talking about that. Uh, cooperation yeah. and let me ask you something. So yeah. I grew up in a lot of rage um, and, and uh, alcoholism, and um, through the Al Anon and a lot of awareness coming up. So this is something that is enmeshed in me because I find the rage and I go, but I'm so weird. I'm like the most positive person. So I <laughs> right. I'm like, What's go You know. Yeah. So and some of it's a prednisone. <laughs> Well, but, I, don't, I, mean, I know about well, that one. I, I want to eat nails. Steroids 101. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to be this peaceful yeah. person in the family. No one else has sobriety or right. any, any recovery. Right. Um, other than Christian, Christianity, it's some wonderful, wonderful, healthy things. It's working out or something. But it, it, this rage, yeah. you know, I feel my illness is connected to it. You know, Crohn's disease. Sure. Oh yeah, Crohn's like, disease you know, is special. Okay, yes. I'm doing a lot of work, but okay, what's well, coming up again? So what what we always say is that those things like that rage, it's it's like the work becomes is being able to speak about what you want and being able to struggle <clears throat> for it. See, we we say in a healthy family, there's really three things operating. We're seeing differences as desirable, struggle is beneficial, and grief is necessary, right? Those three things become the pillars, if you will, the three-legged stool that's going to create a healthy family, right? Differences as desirable, struggle is beneficial, and grief is necessary. So when those things are built into a family, then what's going to happen is when we start to talk, we look to what any behavior is sane instead of shutting the behavior down. But if we shut the behavior down, then it has to show up in a rage maybe to be heard. You see what I mean? Because nobody would listen otherwise. Seven that kids, you, no. You listen. Well, seven kids <laughs> might create a scene like yeah. that, right? Or whatever it is. But see, then what we try to do is figure out is that as an adult, 
how to update what you've learned to do. And so you can learn how to talk about what you want because as you start to go to what you want, you won't need those other things, right? That's how that kind of starts to shift. Well, this is what Dr. Um, Karen Hornay, and she's brilliant. If you haven't dug into any of her work, she's really worth taking some time to get to know. She goes, growing in a healthy way means liberating those evolutionary forces inherent in a man which urge him to realize his given potential. Now, what I want to do is, because we stop at 12.30, or I'm sorry, 1.30? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so, <laughs> let, let me do that. <laughs> or maybe because we went like five minutes over, so like... We can go five minutes over, but as we get, even with five minutes, I'm never going to get through all this. <laughs> what, what I want to do is go to this, and so I can show everybody how this kind of works, some clinical stuff. Okay. All right, so let's just talk about what we can do with some of this stuff. And you guys can get the handouts, go over the other um, 10. So emotional sobriety begins by helping our clients become aware of their emotional dependency and how they react to its gravitational pull. My second book for Hazleton was written about emotional sobriety. The 12 Smart Things is really about 12 things you can do to establish emotional sobriety. And, Hopefully in the next year or so, I'm going to be coming out with the 12 core concepts. So this is Ernie Larson, a, a huge person in the field of recovery. But he says, in relationships, my life and lot changes not when I first demand change in others, but when I take stock in myself, right? So the issue becomes is how do we take stock in ourselves? So what Bill said was, if we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we find at the root of it some unhealthy dependency and its consequent demand. So what I did is I said, well, let's break that down and let's just, and I can have people write this out or I can just talk them through it. Let's have people describe a situation where they got upset and what happened. So this example that I have here is this fellow comes home from a meeting. He got a six month ship. It was a Thursday night. He walks in the house. His wife is watching bones and he says, hey, honey, I'm home. I got my ship. She looks at him and says, so what? He got pissed went, stormed upstairs, slammed the door, started having all these revenge fantasies. I'll just go out, we'll see her. You know, I'll show her, right? She doesn't care about my drink, and I'll go down the street and get a couple six packs, and then we'll see how she likes it. Then he thinks, well, that's just gonna hurt me more. It's gonna hurt me. I'll just not talk to her for the next few days. She's probably thinking, thank God he's not talking to me. So what was his reaction? Well, he went through, he got upset. His unreasonable expectation is he wanted her to feel good about what he was doing, regardless of what he had done to her. This had been his third six-month ship. Hello. And she was not going to jump on that bad wagon. She was protecting herself and saying, uh-uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We're on number three. Hello. And she was going to reserve her right to not be excited at this point and see if he was going to stay the course. Of course she was. But in his world, she should be doing what he wants her to do. What was his unhealthy dependence? So that was his rule, right? You feel good about what I'm doing regardless of what I've done to you. What was his unhealthy dependence? Well, the value of his sobriety depended on her. He was thinking about drinking because she didn't feel okay. Well, that's not going to keep him sober, is it? He needs to stay sober for who? Himself, right? That's the last column. He needs to bring that back into himself so that he's staying sober for the right reason. Because he wants to, because he wants to be that kind of a person, that kind of a man, that kind of a husband, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just show you how this kind of gets worked out in a session. We're talking about this emotional sobriety form. Asked you guys to fill them up. I said, Does anybody want to volunteer and talk about what they put on their form? And you put your hand up. So here we are now in front of all your colleagues. I mean, uh, there's 300 social workers on it. That's it? That's it's just 300. It probably feels like a lot more than that right now. But, you know, what I want to acknowledge, first of all, what it takes a lot of courage for you to come up, because I imagine this is going to get pretty personal. So, what, as you know, that first column, is what is it, what's the event that upset you? What happened? My wife just won't do the dishes. <laughs> she won't do the dishes. Can you tell me what? I mean, it's not that it sounds no, really I assume, petty, but, but it's, there's more to it. I know that. Okay, so, look, I work a lot, all right? 
hang on. She doesn't work right now. We have a six month old daughter. And I ask her that when I come home. I mean, I'm talking like I, if you had a, the commute that I do to go to work, because of where we live, right? I work probably about 11, 12 hours a day. So I come home and there's dishes in the sink. Who's fucking doing it? Right. It's me. And all I ask that she does throughout the day, I mean, I'm saying, like, I pay the bills, she can do whatever she wants. And I, just, and I respect that she takes care of her child. Yeah. So just do the dishes. Because they're not my dishes. So when they're not done and you walk in, what, what happens? What do you do? So that's the second call. Well, you walk in, I get what's upsetting you now. Right. You told her that this is important to me. She's not doing it. Is it all the time she's not doing it or most of the time? <laughs> It's, it's most of the time, well, I'd say it's all the time. She only does it if I text her ahead of time and tell her. And like, my whole point is, why do I have to fucking text you ahead of time to tell you to do the fucking dishes? That's the second part that I'm saying. All right, I got it. So now let's go to that next call. So what happens? When you walk in, you see the dishes aren't done, what do you do? What's the first thing you do? Well, I, I have two options, right? I lose my shit. Yeah. Which I don't want to. Right. Which turns into probably me out of the apartment. Right? And she put you out of the apartment? Probably. Yeah. What's happening for? Right. <laughs> or I just shut up. You shut, how do you shut up? What do you do? I just I sit on the couch. You sit on the couch. And what do you do while you're on the couch? <laughs> what? This is embarrassing. Um, I sit on the couch and I play Angry Birds. Angry Birds? Yeah. <laughs> How fitting that is, isn't it? <laughs> you play Angry Birds. I play Angry Birds. Yeah, um... And then what happens? You're on the couch and play Angry Birds? Oh, I just, I fucking shut up, man. I don't, oh, like, so she'll, I don't why she'll say Yeah, because, she, because what she does is she wants to tell me about her day and tell me about the shit, and all I can fucking think about is she didn't do the fucking dishes. So I don't care. You need money for this, you want money for the car insurance, great. Do the fucking dishes, do your part. So you just, you just cut off. You just emotionally that, shut <clears> up, distance yourself. Yeah, because the other way doesn't work right now. Right. Right? Right. Well, yeah, blow it up. And I, and that, I don't have the control of it. The truth is that they're not very dissimilar, right? They're really... Opposite sides of the same point. We don't don't worry about that right now. Okay. We'll get to that some other point. All right. So, so and this is the important thing. So, the rule you have, the unenforceable rule, is that she, you demand that she does those dishes. Right. That's your rule. So, would it be <laughs> safe, would this be safe to say? You'd say it this way: If you love me, you would do the dishes. Hmm. Like yeah. if you love yeah. me, do this. Yeah. If you love me, you yeah. you yeah. respect some of the. Well, I, I ask right. one thing. So yeah, one thing. Right. And you sound like you make it a small thing because I want to say to you, that's not a small thing. You're asking her a lot. And I'll explain what I mean by that later. And I know that that like you're going. What do you mean? What are you talking? It's just one thing. But no. Yeah, it's, like I'm thinking it's, it's a lot. Okay. You want her to do the dishes every day, regardless of what's going on in her life. You see, that's what I mean. <laughs> you're not asking for her a small thing. You're asking her to totally disregard what's important for her and to pay attention to what's important to you. See, that's the rule. All right, okay, I will try. Right. Well, you know, let's go a little farther with it, though. See, because, so then what you're saying is, is the, the dependency now that you have is that your love for her and your good feelings for her are dependent on her doing what you want her to do. See, that's what you're setting up here. And so there's no possibility, you're not creating any possibility outside of this demand for her to be connected to you. So you're saying, if we have the relationship on my terms, then we're okay. But if you're not going to meet me on my terms, then hell with you. And you throw her away. I mean, you act like she's throwing you away, but I'll tell you, man, you're throwing well, her away. Well, kind of feels like she is. I, that, of course you do, because it, your command is that she's supposed to do this. All right, look, here's a real important thing. What do you think makes those dishes so important? What's that? Mean? What happens when you see those dishes? What does that trigger? You? It's got to connect to something. Well, okay. Um, 
my mom when I was when I was a kid, I come home from school. And I would judge the night based on the conditions. If they were on the sink, what would happen that night? If the dishes were in the sink, it meant that um, my mom was drinking that night. What was going to happen that night if mom was drinking? Nothing good. What does nothing good mean, Andrew? <sighs> She's fucking angry, man. She was angry. She got guys with her and never seen before. Um, I, I didn't eat. She's coming to my room and yelling at me. So I'm not sure what the guys do. Stupid shit to me. You weren't safe if you saw the dishes in the sink, were you? And somehow, when you come home and those dishes aren't done, all of this stuff with your mom is right there again, man. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of times what happens is that we demand that our future reverse the experiences of our past. But it doesn't work that way. See, what we need to do, we can start it right now, but it's going to take a lot of this. You got a lot to say to your mom. We got a lot of stuff to work through with your mom. And that's not going to go away by demanding your wife do the dishes now. That's going to go away by you opening up a lot of this pain, which is I see how hard it is for you. I understand that. But when you keep avoiding it, you keep doing these other things, you're not doing yourself, you're not doing your marriage a favor at all. Well, that gives you a sense of... Uh... So if you send me an email at abphd at msn.com, I'll send you a handout with all those slides. Um, I also sent that to you, Ariella, the uh, PDF of all the slides, yeah. So you should have a copy of that as well. Um, but I will send it to you guys if you send me an email. You also can go on my website underneath handouts. You can print it out from there. Either way, if you want it more direct, you can just send me an email. I'll attach the PDF to the file. So that gives you a bit of a taste of this whole emotional sobriety stuff. Um, I guess we'll have to come back and do part two. Yes. To go over all the yes. We could schedule that at some point. Um, so look, I'm glad you're here. Please share this information. If you're interested in the two-year program I have in Gestalt Experiential Therapy, there's a flyer on my website. You could also ask me about it. We meet once a month for two years on Saturdays from 9 to 3. The day usually goes with a didactic session discussion, some aspect of Gestalt therapy. Then typically I'll do a demonstration or so, a film of Walt doing a demonstration and discussing it. And then uh, yeah, we have lunch, we provide lunch, cold cut sandwiches. And then afternoon we come back and either there are student sessions where each student become, is the therapist in the round or is a client in the round. They have to do that once in the two years. Um, or we have another family in the afternoon, or we break off and do some exercises and stuff like that. It's really cool stuff. Uh, this is the fifth year that I've done the program, so it's 10 years old. But it's continued on from Dr. Kempler's work when he was here in West L.A. And then I was the executive director of the program then, we probably articulated about seven classes. So, thank you, Mariella, for having me. Thank you. Thank you.